the police officer sentenced to 40 years in prison in the death of a six-year-old boy with autism. Careless and irresponsible police officers shoot our citizens in their own homes. Because of him and people like him, victims are afraid to come forward. He cried while describing his work as sheriff and his wife and children cried when they found out that he would be spending time in prison. He's a man who relentlessly degraded, belittled, assaulted, and raped women. Number 15, Joseph Miedzianowski. Joseph Miedzianowski, a former police officer in Chicago, was revealed to be one of the most corrupt cops in the city's history. Despite his seemingly illustrious career, Miedzianowski had been secretly involved in criminal activities throughout his 22-year tenure. He utilized his extensive knowledge of the gang underworld to run a cocaine sales ring, collaborating with gang members and using street informants to shake down drug dealers and sell drugs. What they would do is they would sell cocaine to somebody and Padilla would get paid. That's what kept people like Joe Mijanowski to go untouched. And then Mijanowski and his partner would pull over the guys who just left with the cocaine. In 2001, Mead Zianowski's crimes caught up with him, leading to his arrest, trial, and subsequent conviction. The judge condemned his actions, stating that he had violated society by trafficking drugs and arming street gang members. Mead Zianowski was found guilty of drug conspiracy and racketeering, and he received a life sentence in prison without the possibility of parole. It underscores the necessity of thorough background checks and ongoing oversight to identify and remove corrupt officers from the force. He's such a confident, cocky guy that he is so believable. Put your hands up! What the f man? What is this? Please, gentlemen. But he used the job to further whatever it is that he was doing in his criminal life. Whatever caused him to turn to the dark side was now more important than the police department. Number 14, David Carrick. David Carrick, a former police officer in England, used his position of authority to engage in abusive relationships with multiple women he met on dating apps. Carrick's behavior included physical and physical attack, controlling their actions and depriving them of basic needs such as food. The influence of men like you in positions of power stands in the way of a revolution of women's dignity. There were many signs that we should have joined together. He should have been rooted out during his career as a police officer. The system is so rotten, public trust has fallen so far, that tinkering around the edges is not going to cut it. Court salutes the courage of all the victims and their families, and I hope they're able to thrive in the rest of their lives. Despite numerous complaints of domestic issues against him, Carrick was recertified as an armed police officer in 2017. However, his crimes eventually caught up with him when he was reported for physical misconduct. Carrick was suspended from police work and later pleaded guilty to a total of 49 charges, including 24 counts of physical misconduct. The severity of Carrick's actions shocked the public and drew strong condemnation from officials. He was sentenced to 36 life sentences with a minimum term of 30 years, reflecting the gravity of his offenses. Carrick's case highlights the importance of addressing issues of domestic attack within law enforcement agencies and implementing strict measures to ensure the safety and well-being of individuals vulnerable to attacks. This, this is the allegation that's been made to us, okay, sir? There's no necessity. Yes, there is. These women are not weak or ineffectual. They were victims of your criminal mindset. When you sign up to become a police officer, you sign up to a certain set of values and standards, a code of conduct. He's a man who relentlessly degraded, belittled, assaulted, and raped women. And if David Carrick didn't have that compass to begin with, how did he end up serving within the ranks of a police force? Number 13, Wayne Cousins. Wayne Cousins, a Metropolitan Police officer in the UK, committed a heinous crime that shocked the nation. He abducted, physically attacked, and slayed Sarah Everard, a young marketing executive, while she was walking home. Today's sentencing reflects the impact of the awful crimes that Wayne Cousins um, committed. Photographs of the lane in question show that it has a banked verge up one side with some woodland at the top. It's the courage of those victims to come forward that, is, that has brought him to justice. He was looking at them in the face as they did so, the window down, his genitals right there in their line of sight. Cousins, who presented himself as a police officer, exploited his position of trust to carry out this brutal act. 
The details of Cousin's crime were disturbing, as he violated, slayed, burned, and dumped Everard's body. His actions shook public confidence in the police force and raised questions about the safety and security of individuals in society. Cousin's trial resulted in a conviction for kidnapping, physical attack, and slaying. He was sentenced to life in prison with a whole life order, ensuring that he will spend the remainder of his life behind bars. This tragic case exposed a deep betrayal of public trust and emphasized the importance of robust background checks and mental health evaluations. He recognized the person who had exposed himself to her and immediately contacted police. It's clear to all of us that Cousins caused immense hurt and trauma to those, to those women. His car was caught on CCTV and the registration number was noted by their manager at the time of the second incident. The fact he did all of this while serving as a police officer is something that brings shame on myself and all of us. For individuals entering law enforcement, it also sparked conversations about the need to address gender-based violence and promote safety for all members of society. Number 12, the Baltimore Gun Trace Task Force. In Baltimore, a group of eight gun trace task force officers exploited their positions and engaged in a range of criminal activities. Rather than fulfilling their duty to protect and serve, these officers stole money from victims. 13 officers brought down for robbing citizens, falsifying reports, and trying to cover it all up. A man who Baltimore City just paid millions to as part of the settlement in the gun trace task force scandal. The sergeant who headed the gun trace task force is not expected to be out of prison until 2038. Has been arrested for attempted murder. This according to crime and justice lead investigative reporter Joy Lapola. Wrongfully detained individuals, fabricated police reports, and even distributed drugs. Their actions undermined public trust and contributed to a climate of corruption within the police department. Following an investigation, all eight officers were charged with conspiracy to distribute drugs and racketeering. The trial exposed the extent of their misconduct and highlighted the systemic issues within the police force that enabled such behavior to persist unchecked. The officers were ultimately convicted and their sentences varied based on their level of involvement in the crimes they received prison terms ranging from 7 to 25 years, holding them accountable for their actions. The person that I once was, I'm just a shell of the, the person I once was. I want my life back. The guy who, who passed himself off as Jenkins' representative, who was not a lawyer, was actually one of his former cellmates. Attorney Steve Silverman tells us that he is heartbroken by this news and that the allegations are not consistent with the man he's come to know. And serving as a warning to others who might consider abusing their authority. Number 11, Derek Stafford. The case of Derek Stafford, a former deputy marshal, stirred significant controversy and divided public opinion. During a traffic stop in 2015, Stafford fatally shot six-year-old Jeremy Martis and severely injured his father, Christopher Few. The incident received widespread attention and sparked debates about excessive use of force by law enforcement. Stafford was subsequently found guilty of manslaughter and attempted manslaughter. The judge sentenced him to 40 years in prison. A police officer sentenced to 40 years in prison in the death of a six-year-old boy with autism. For the juvenile. Several officers had converged on the scene and their body cam video played a major role in this. I never saw a few before. A decision that generated mixed reactions. Some viewed the punishment as just, considering the tragic loss of a young life and the need for accountability. Others, however, felt that the sentence was too harsh, arguing that Stafford's actions were not intentional and that the circumstances surrounding the incident warranted a different outcome. It is crucial to reflect on such cases to strive for a justice system that upholds the principles of fairness, transparency, and the protection of individual rights. Stafford's former partner, Norris Greenhouse Jr., the other officer allegedly involved in this shooting, heads to trial in June. You advise the juvenile deceased. Number 10, Daniel Holtzclaw. In the city of Oklahoma, the streets were meant to be kept safe by the hands of justice. However, within the ranks of law enforcement, a wolf in sheep's clothing lurked. Daniel Holtzclaw, once hailed as a respected police officer, would soon be unmasked as a corrupt predator, preying on the vulnerable with his badge as his shield. Born in Guam in December 1986, Holtzclaw was raised in a family entrenched in law enforcement. His father, Eric, served as a lieutenant in the Enid Police Department 
and it seemed as though Daniel was destined to follow in his footsteps. He excelled in sports, particularly football, and held dreams of playing professionally. However, when those dreams faded, he turned to his backup plan and joined the Oklahoma City Police Department. At first glance, Holt's Claw appeared to be just another officer dedicated to serving and protecting his community. But beneath his uniform, a sinister darkness grew. He targeted women from low-income areas, using their criminal records or outstanding warrants as an excuse to exercise his power. Th Six daughters! No bail! 26 daughters! No bail! 26 count! No bail! We went through them by hand looking for his unit number and we wrote down everybody he ran. It's horrifying just to rehash all those memories. First thing Kim Davis thought is, a cop doesn't just wake up and start raping women one day. The protest against accused Oklahoma right. City Police Officer Daniel Holt's Claw. You saw I something. No, 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 I saw, I saw, yeah, you dragged me between the two buildings that street. Through manipulative background checks, he selectively chose his victims, knowing that their vulnerability would make them easier targets. The truth finally came to light when multiple women summoned the courage to step forward and share their horrifying experiences. The evidence against Holt's Claw was overwhelming, and the courtroom became a battlefield of justice where the victims, detectives, and attorneys fought for retribution. Holt's Claw was found guilty on 18 charges, leaving the victims and their supporters relieved that his reign of terror would finally come to an end. As the judge announced the recommended sentence of an astounding 263 years in prison, Holt's Claw's facade crumbled. Tears welled up in his eyes, and he shivered with fear. Some of them, as soon as I knocked on the door and they knew what we were investigating, we just got together and, and beat on doors. I on him, and I mean, I didn't, at this moment, I'm thinking, like, I don't have a choice. Finally realizing the gravity of his actions, the victims, accompanied by the unwavering support of their advocates, were present to witness the moment justice was served. Lead detective Kim Davis, who had been by their side throughout the harrowing journey, held their hands tightly, satisfied that Holt's claw would never walk free again. Sherry Dickerson, a victim's advocate, acknowledged the destruction caused by his choices. She expressed a glimmer of hope that perhaps, through rehabilitation, Holt's claw might find redemption and become a mentor for others seeking to change their destructive paths. Holt's Claw's life, once filled with promise and honor, had taken a tragic turn, leading him to the precipice of a lifetime behind bars. Victims didn't come forward because they didn't think we'd believe them. Prosecutors want to raise the amount of his $500,000 bond or have it revoked. That was enough for them to go, oh, somebody believes me. Number nine, Derek Chauvin. In the bustling city of Minneapolis, the dark underbelly of police brutality and racial injustice reared its head in the form of Derek Chauvin. This former police officer would forever be etched in the annals of history as the man responsible for the tragic demise of George Floyd, a catalyst that sparked nationwide outrage and a fervent cry for change. Chauvin's journey to infamy began in the Twin Cities area, where he grew up and attended Park High School in Cottage Grove. Known for his football prowess, he showcased his skills on the school's team before pursuing higher education. He enrolled at Normandale Community College and later transferred to Metropolitan State University, where he earned a bachelor's degree in law enforcement. The court commits you to the custody of the Commissioner of Corrections for a period of 270 months. It's 270. Here we are nearly three years later and the city is still working to repair the relationship between its residents and police. Responsible for the death of George Floyd will serve time in federal prison in Arizona. And just today, a $9 million settlement was announced for two people pinned down by Officer Derek Chauvin. Abuse of a position of trust and authority and also the particular cruelty shown to George Floyd. In 2001, Chauvin joined the Minneapolis Police Department, where his misconduct would eventually tarnish the badge he swore to protect. Over the course of his career, Chauvin accumulated a troubling record, marred by numerous complaints of excessive force. While 18 complaints were filed against him, only two resulted in any disciplinary action. One incident in particular stood out, a 2017 case where he was among the officers involved in the shooting and subsequent demise of a suspect. It was on May 25, 2020, that Chauvin's name would forever be etched in history. Responding to a call about a man attempting to use a counterfeit $20 bill, 
Chauvin and three other officers encountered George Floyd, a 46-year-old black man. What followed would be an act of unwarranted violence and cruelty captured on video that would reverberate around the world. The former Minneapolis police officer Derek Chauvin was escorted by U.S. Marshals. You're prohibited from possessing firearms, ammunition, or explosives for the remainder of your life. Brian O'Hara calling Derek Chauvin an example of the cancer that has infected the Minneapolis Police Department over the years. This is an example of the cancer that has infected this department. 22 and a half years when you add up the months that he just mentioned there, that is the sentence for Derek Chauvin. As the video circulated, outrage swelled and protests against police brutality and racial injustice erupted across the nation. Chauvin, with his knee pressed against Floyd's neck, for a chilling nine minutes and 29 seconds, disregarded Floyd's desperate pleas for breath. The life drained from Floyd's body and the world watched in horror. The subsequent trial became a pivotal moment, a litmus test for the accountability of law enforcement. The jury, presented with the overwhelming evidence and the graphic video, delivered a resounding verdict, guilty on all three charges. Chauvin's bail was revoked and he was remanded into custody. On June 25, 2021, Chauvin faced his sentencing and the courtroom brimmed with anticipation. Stoic and unflinching, he removed his mask and offered condolences to the Floyd family, but failed to express any remorse for his actions. He even filed an appeal, claiming bias and unfairness during the trial. The sentence of 22 and a half years in prison, with credit for time served, evoked a mixed response. Some felt it was too lenient, believing that a longer sentence would have better served justice. Others saw it as a signal that no police officer was above the law. Number 8. Michael Dotro In the quiet streets of Edison, New Jersey, the illusion of safety was shattered when Michael Dotro, a police officer entrusted with upholding the law, was revealed to be a corrupt figure within the ranks of the Edison Police Department. Dotro's trajectory from praise to condemnation serves as a cautionary tale showcasing the devastating consequences of misplaced power and violating the public's trust. Joining the force in 2003, Dotro's career flourished, propelling him to the rank of sergeant in 2011. He was commended for his dedication and service to the community, but beneath the accolades, a sinister side lay dormant, waiting to be exposed. In 2017, Dotro's true colors were revealed as he faced multiple charges and was accused of attempted obstruction of justice and conspiracy to tamper with witnesses. Because of him and people like him, victims are afraid to come forward. It represents the worst that we can possibly expect from someone in our society. The sentence to be imposed in this particular case is because Mr. Dotro, through his conduct... Acknowledging his guilt, Dotro pleaded guilty to the federal charges leveled against him admitting that he had violated the law and breached the trust placed in him as a police officer. In 2019, the gavel of justice came down, sentencing Dotro to a staggering 20 years in federal prison. Despite his pleas for leniency, citing his previous clean record and his desire to be a good father to his children, the judge remained unswayed, recognizing the gravity of the crimes committed by a police officer sworn to protect. The courtroom, filled with anticipation, awaited Dotro's reaction to the conviction. Clad in a green prison jumpsuit, he appeared composed, almost detached from the severity of the situation. As the judge delivered the verdict, Dotro's demeanor remained unchanged. The Edison Police Department, already grappling with allegations of corruption and misconduct, was dealt another blow by Dotro's case. The mishandling of the investigation, allowing several officers implicated in the conspiracy to retire or resign before facing disciplinary action, only amplified the need for greater accountability and oversight within law enforcement. Number 7. Zachary Wester In the tranquil county of Jackson, Florida, the badge of a sheriff's deputy served as both a symbol of trust and a mask for Zachary Wester's dark intentions. Behind his polished facade, lay a man addicted to power, misusing his authority to fabricate evidence and tarnish the lives of innocent motorists. His reign of deception would come crashing down, leading to his conviction and a 12-year prison sentence that would mark the end of his corrupt tenure. The year was 2016, when Wester's descent into corruption began. Routine traffic stops became opportunities for him to plant narcotics on unsuspecting individuals. 
Under the guise of enforcing the law, he preyed on innocent motorists, targeting them with the intent to frame them for crimes they did not commit. This heinous exploitation of power continued for years until a brave driver lodged a complaint, setting in motion the investigation that would expose Wester's web of lies. Found guilty of 19 charges involving fabricating evidence and arresting innocent people. The drugs were there. I did not put the narcotics there. Was sentenced to 12 years and six months in prison this afternoon. The evidence against Wester was damning, revealing a pattern of misconduct that went beyond a single isolated incident. In 2019, he was arrested and charged with multiple crimes, including racketeering, official misconduct, perjury, fabricating evidence, and possession of controlled substances. Throughout his trial, Wester maintained his innocence, denying any involvement in planting illegal substances on individuals. However, the weight of the evidence presented in court proved overwhelming, leading the jury to deliver a guilty verdict on 19 counts. In the courtroom, Wester's arrogance and dismissive attitude were on full display. He showed little remorse for the lives he had irreparably damaged, seemingly more concerned with preserving his reputation than accepting responsibility for his crimes. As the victims sat in the gallery, their voices echoed the satisfaction they felt with the outcome, knowing that Wester would no longer be able to use his badge as a weapon against the innocent. About an abuse of an incredible power, about the abuse of the incredible trust. Have you ever seen that before? No, sir. Was that in your car? No, sir. Either jury find as follows as to the counts charged and the information. Count one guilty of racketeering as charged. And you'll never know what you've done to me until you have children of your own, so. The entire time he did have a mask on, so it was a little bit hard to see, but it was pretty intense. On September 7, 2021, the judge handed down Wester's sentence, a 12-year prison term accompanied by over $100,000 in fines. The community of Jackson County, along with those impacted by Wester's corruption, grappled with the aftermath of his crimes. Number 6. Eric DeVolcanaire Kansas City, a city pulsating with life, became the backdrop for a tragic incident that further fueled the debate surrounding police brutality and racial profiling in the United States. Eric DeVolcanaire, a former police detective, found himself at the center of controversy as his actions resulted in the fatal attack of Cameron Lamb in 2019. The repercussions of this encounter sent shockwaves through the community challenging the systemic racism embedded within law enforcement. It was a routine traffic incident that brought DeValconaire and his partner to a red pickup truck in Kansas City. Donning plain clothes and police department vests, they entered the backyard without a legal warrant, oblivious to the unfolding tragedy that awaited them. Cameron Lamb, behind the wheel of the pickup truck, was slowly reversing it down a ramp into the basement garage. Careless and irresponsible police officers shoot our citizens in their own homes. And guilty of the lesser included offense of involuntary manslaughter in the second degree, a class E felony. Eric DeVocaneer is charged with involuntary manslaughter in the killing of Cameron Lamb. As to count two, the unclassified felony of armed criminal action, the court finds the defendant guilty. Do you believe that Eric DeVocaneer saved your life? On December 19th, December 3rd, 2019. Friends and family members of George Floyd, Jacob Blake, and Oscar Grant are in town for the trial. County judge you just heard there found a Kansas City police detective guilty of involuntary manslaughter and armed criminal action. Uh, prosecutors called several witnesses today. So far, all of them police officers. Tomorrow, they will call more. In the ensuing chaos, DeValconaire opened fire, firing four shots at Lamb claiming to have seen Lamb's left hand reach for a weapon and point it at his partner. Lamb's life was tragically cut short at the scene, leaving a grieving family and a community searching for answers. The subsequent trial shed light on the events of that fateful day, and in November 2021, a judge found DeValconaire guilty in a bench trial. The sentence was delivered, a three-year term for involuntary manslaughter and a six-year term for armed criminal actions to be served concurrently. As DeValconaire sat in the courtroom, the weight of his actions hung heavily in the air. His tears flowed intermittently as he narrated the incident, but it was difficult to discern whether they stemmed from true remorse or self-pity. We're demanding. We come in from all over the country. 
We're not going to stand still. Shooting death of a black man outside of his home. Eric DeVacanaire will be sentenced for the 2019 killing of Cameron Lamb. And let's th let this continue to happen to us over and over again. Shooting and killing him, he did so without considering or being aware of the substantial and unjustifiable risk. And DeVolcanier's lawyer asked the detective who was with him what he thinks now of that night. Soon as the judge said guilty, members of Cameron Lamb's family, including his mother, began to cry. Well, there were two. One was kind of a bombshell dropped when the prosecutor suggested that someone may have planted a gun. The sentence was handed down, and the courtroom held its breath, waiting for DeVolcanier's reaction. In a state of shock, he held his hand at the desk, his face etched with disbelief. The verdict was deemed fair by Cameron Lamb's mother, Lori Bay, who acknowledged the mental pain she would forever endure. Akeel Bay, Lamb's stepfather, expressed hope that the sentencing would spur change within the Kansas City Police Department, urging an end to the systemic racism that disproportionately affected black Americans. Number 5. Charlie Reeder The bitter winds of Pike County howled through the desolate streets, carrying with them whispers of betrayal and corruption. Charlie Reeder, once a figure of authority and trust, now stood at the center of a storm that threatened to consume him whole. The former sheriff, with his weathered visage and weary eyes, had fallen from grace, his tarnished badge now a mocking reminder of his transgressions. It started with a whisper, a hushed rumor that danced on the lips of the townsfolk. They spoke of missing funds, money that had vanished like smoke in the wind. As the gossip swirled, so did the weight of suspicion, and it was in the suffocating grip of that suspicion that Charlie Reeder found himself ensnared. He cried while describing his work as sheriff, and his wife and children cried when they found out that he would be spending time in prison. Pike County, Ohio Sheriff is now serving three years in prison related to corruption. Your Honor, please do not send me to prison. Charles Reeder pleaded guilty last year to theft, conflict of interest, and tampering with evidence. I have run, but I'm not run. I still have a lot of good left in me. There were a lot of tears inside here today. The sheriff cried as he begged the judge for leniency. The accusations were grave, a damning portrait of a man entangled in his own web of deceit. Theft in office, they called it, tampering with evidence. The very pillars of justice that he had sworn to uphold now crumbled beneath the weight of his transgressions. It was a fall from grace that reverberated through the community, shattering the trust they had placed in him. Charlie Reeder, desperate to salvage what remained of his reputation, sought solace in justification. With a trembling voice and eyes that pleaded for understanding, he professed his innocence. The money, he claimed, had been used to help the community, to fund projects that would uplift their weary spirits. But his words fell upon ears hardened by the stark truth of evidence. The damning trail of paper led them to the heart of the matter, a gambling addiction that had gripped Charlie Reeder like a vice. The very money he had sworn to protect had become fuel for his insatiable desire, feeding a habit that gnawed at his soul. The once respected sheriff had succumbed to the allure of chance, sacrificing his duty, his honor, and the trust of his fellow citizens on the altar of avarice. The courtroom was a somber stage, a theater of justice where Charlie Reeder stood as the lead in his own tragedy. The weight of his crimes hung heavy in the air, suffocating the room with its oppressive presence the gavel fell, and with it came the sentence, a six-and-a-half-year prison term, a mere fraction of the time he had spent betraying the very oath he had sworn to uphold. Number 4. David Oliver David Oliver, the former police chief of Brimfield Township, was a man who seemed to embody the very essence of law enforcement. With his chiseled jawline and stern gaze, he commanded respect and exuded authority. But behind that facade of duty and honor lay a shocking truth a truth that would shatter the illusion of righteousness he had carefully constructed. Oliver had gained notoriety for his social media presence. His witty and humorous commentary on Facebook about criminals had garnered him a loyal following and made him somewhat of a local celebrity. People admired his quick wit and his ability to find humor in the darkest corners of society. Little did they know there was a dark corner within Oliver himself, a shadowy realm where power was exploited and trust was betrayed. Crystal Casterline, a dedicated and ambitious female officer, had served under Oliver's command for years. She had joined the force with dreams of making a difference in her community and upholding justice. But those dreams were crushed under the weight of a relentless nightmare. Casterline accused Oliver of harassment, 
allegations that sent shockwaves through the department and the community. Casterline's accusations were harrowing, detailing incidents of groping and trapping that had left her feeling violated and trapped herself. Her voice shook with a mixture of fear and determination as she stepped forward, refusing to be silenced any longer. I was not a nice boss at times. I expected performance. David Oliver resigned from the police department. Today, he was officially charged and he was found guilty. Hugs escalated to groping, humping me, trapping me places, and forcing me into positions where he would press his body. you become the moat that you wrote about in your book. Do you realize that? That police department, as it exists, are the biggest congregation of cowards on the face of the earth. In a battle between good and evil, truth and deception, she stood tall, risking everything to expose the man who had betrayed his badge and his oath. The courtroom buzzed with anticipation as Oliver's trial commenced. The once respected police chief, now a defendant, sat stoically, his eyes avoiding the gaze of those who had once seen him as a hero. The evidence presented was damning, a tapestry woven with the threads of pain and betrayal. Witness after witness took the stand, recounting their own encounters with the man who had used his position of power to intimidate and exploit. Oliver's defense attorney attempted to chip away at the credibility of the witnesses, questioning their motives and attempting to cast doubt on their testimonies. But the weight of the truth was undeniable. The web of lies Oliver had spun began to unravel thread by thread until there was nothing left but his own guilt, exposed for all to see. As the judge delivered the verdict, the room held its breath. Oliver's gaze remained fixed on the floor, his shoulders slumped under the weight of his misdeeds. Guilty. The word hung heavy in the air, mingling with a sense of justice finally served. Oliver had pleaded guilty to all charges, his admission sealing his fate. Number 3. Marcus Eberhardt Marcus Eberhardt was a name that echoed through the tight-knit community of East Point, Michigan leaving behind a trail of sorrow and disbelief. Once an officer entrusted with upholding the law and protecting the innocent, he now stood accused of a crime that had forever altered the lives of those involved. The events that unfolded on that fateful day would forever be etched in the annals of the town's history. Marcus Eberhardt had always been seen as a pillar of the community, a beacon of safety in a neighborhood plagued by crime. Residents would often recount tales of his bravery, how he had saved lives and brought criminals to justice. But on that ill-fated afternoon, the narrative took a tragic turn, forever shattering the trust that had been placed in him. It began like any other day in East Point. The sun hung high in the sky, casting a warm glow on the streets below. Gregory Towns, a troubled man who had run afoul of the law in the past, found himself in a confrontation with Marcus Eberhardt. The specifics of the encounter would later be dissected in the courtroom, where the truth would emerge piece by agonizing piece. Eyewitnesses spoke of a heated exchange between Eberhardt and Towns, the tension palpable in the air. In a moment of judgment clouded by frustration and anger, Eberhardt reached for his taser, a tool meant to subdue and incapacitate. But what followed was a tragedy that would shake the very foundation of justice in the town. The crackling sound of electricity filled the air as the taser found its mark on Gregory Towns' body. The excruciating pain coursed through his veins, rendering him powerless and defenseless. The aftermath of that day brought forth a torrent of grief and disbelief. The community, once united in its trust for law enforcement, now found itself grappling with a profound loss of faith. Questions swirled through the minds of East Point's residents, demanding answers that seemed elusive in their complexity. Murder, death, that's what I think, that's what they did to him. Being sued over another incident, as you mentioned, involving Slager and the use of force. I don't know you're being recorded right now. Okay, let's go. Cool. One step up. You got another suspension, so you're going to go to jail. As the trial unfolded, the truth began to take shape. It was revealed that Marcus Eberhardt had deviated from the established protocols using excessive force that violated the very principles he had sworn to uphold. The taser, meant as a tool of restraint, had been wielded recklessly with devastating consequences. The evidence presented left little room for doubt, painting a damning portrait of an officer who had strayed from the path of righteousness. In 2022, the jury's verdict reverberated through the courtroom, marking a pivotal moment in Michigan's legal history. Marcus Eberhardt was found guilty of involuntary manslaughter and misconduct in office, 
becoming the first police officer in the state to be convicted for the improper use of a taser. It was a bittersweet victory for justice, a step towards accountability that would hopefully heal the wounds inflicted on a grieving community. Wilson and his attorney claim he was tased after he was put into submission. The video, at least at the outset, seems to support that. The sentences for former Sergeant Marcus Eberhardt and former Corporal Howard Weems after a jury found them guilty. The jury know that they saw that those officers were guilty. I just don't agree with the time that was given. Number two, Daniel Saylor. Once hailed as the guardian of the peaceful town of Windermere, Florida, Daniel Saylor's fall from grace was swift and catastrophic. The former police officer found himself entangled in a web of accusations and legal troubles that would forever tarnish his reputation. It all started with whispers of a prominent resident's home, an expansion that would expose a hidden underbelly of corruption and deceit. Daniel Saylor had dedicated his life to law enforcement, taking pride in upholding justice and maintaining the tranquil charm of Windermere. For years, he had patrolled the streets with an unwavering sense of duty, earning the respect and admiration of the community. But as fate would have it, his tenure would unravel under the weight of an unexpected storm. It began innocently enough, with rumors circulating among the town's elite. Whispers of a palatial mansion being constructed in violation of zoning laws reached Sailor's ears. As the town's chief of police, he couldn't turn a blind eye to such allegations. Duty called, and he embarked on what he believed to be a noble quest for truth and justice. But as Saylor delved deeper into the case, he found himself facing roadblocks and resistance at every turn. His investigation took him down a treacherous path, littered with obstacles and unanswered questions. Powerful figures stood in his way, determined to protect their secrets and preserve their privileged status. Undeterred, Saylor pressed on, compelled by an unwavering belief in the righteousness of his cause. The evidence began to stack up against the prominent resident painting a damning picture of corruption and deceit. The truth seemed within reach, and Saylor was ready to expose it to the world. But sometimes, the pursuit of justice can lead to unintended consequences. As the case gained momentum, the winds of change began to blow in a different direction. My life has basically changed dramatically. I, I spent my whole career serving this country and serving the state of Florida. Police chief admits he misused his badge. Daniel Saylor used to be Windermere's police chief. Saylor's attorney is asking for probation and community service for the former disgraced police chief. The tides turned against Saylor, and he found himself thrust into a legal maelstrom, accused of perjury in a trial that would seal his fate. The courtroom became a battleground, where the once respected police chief fought for his innocence against a relentless prosecution. Saylor adamantly maintained that he had been unjustly targeted, a victim of a system marred by corruption and misconduct. Every fiber of his being screamed out for vindication, for the truth to prevail. But the jury's verdict shattered his hopes and dreams. Guilty. And today, his plea deal makes him a common criminal. The judge says with Saylor's freedom on the line, he just needs more time to decide his fate. Uh, but I did that to myself, and I understand that now, um, that I take full responsibility for what happened. The word echoed through the courtroom, searing into Saylor's soul like a branding iron. Eight years in prison awaited him, a sentence that felt like a lifetime. His name, once synonymous with honor and integrity, now carried the weight of shame and disgrace. Whether Daniel Saylor was a victim of prosecutorial misconduct or a fallen hero consumed by hubris is a matter of debate. The tale of his rise and fall serves as a cautionary reminder that even the noblest of intentions can become ensnared in a web of intrigue and corruption. Windermere, once a bastion of tranquility, was forever scarred by the revelations that shook its foundations, leaving a community to rebuild and a former police chief to wrestle with the demons of his past. Any police officer that finds themselves in this situation, there's going to be a, a watch just to make sure they're okay. I told the court every day in this courtroom we depend on people telling the truth. And if you don't tell the truth, there has to be ramifications for that. In the end, the judge indicated that he has to turn over his guns and he's going to turn them over to the Seminole County. Number one, Aaron Dean. In the bustling city of Fort Worth, where the night air crackles with life, tragedy struck one fateful evening. Aaron Dean, a former officer with the Fort Worth Police Department, would forever be intertwined with the name Tatiana Jefferson. It was a wellness check, a simple act of concern transformed into an indelible mark on both their lives. 
David, the jury, while rejecting the more serious charge of murder, nonetheless found the officer's actions illegal. Former Texas police officer was found guilty of manslaughter in the shooting death of a woman in her own home. When I saw the barrel of that gun pointed at me, and I fired a single shot from my duty weapon. The officer claimed he thought there was a burglary in progress when he opened fire, but there wasn't. On that ill-fated night, Dean answered a non-emergency call that would haunt him for eternity. As he cautiously approached the residence, his heart raced, unsure of what lay beyond the door. In an instant, the tranquility shattered. Startled by a figure inside, he reacted, a split-second decision that would irrevocably change the course of their lives. Tatiana Jefferson, a vibrant soul full of dreams and aspirations, was caught in a moment of vulnerability. I just want you to remember it exactly the way you do. Do you remember if she had the gun up or down? <clears throat> and I, I knew that that I've shot that person. Heard her scream and, and saw her fall like this. Believing the prosecutors claimed that Dean, who never announced himself as a police officer, had acted recklessly. The bullet pierced the silence, stealing her life away. Shock and disbelief enveloped the community as the incident rippled through the nation, sparking a fervent debate on police accountability. In the aftermath, the truth emerged, painting a stark picture of shattered protocols and broken trust. Dean's actions were deemed a violation of departmental policies, prompting his resignation from the force. The justice system's scales tipped, albeit to a lesser degree, as he was found guilty of a reduced charge. Now, Aaron Dean stands before a judge, the weight of his actions bearing down upon him, his once decorated uniform replaced with the cold, unforgiving confines of a prison cell. Behind the steel bars, he contemplates the fleeting nature of choices, grappling with the devastating consequences of a single moment. That's all for this video, folks. Thank you so much for watching, and we will see you in our next video.